Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. <clears throat> Special welcome to anyone who might be here for the first time. We're grateful to have you here with us. It's good to be back with you. I got hit pretty good uh, with COVID. Me and my sweet little wife had as much fun as you can possibly have fighting sickness together. We were just <laughs> blessed for a couple weeks. So uh, be praying for several in the body who are uh, still fighting. We have... Uh, Susan, I don't want to say her last name on live stream, but she's in the hospital uh, with pneumonia, COVID, and we just want to be lifting that sweet saint. She's one of the, just the salt of the earth kind of people, one of the sweetest ones I've met in my journey. So, so be lifting up Daniel and Susan, and there are many others uh, down sick. This morning, we're going to take back up in the book of Romans. So if you'll turn to Romans 8, it has been simmering for just a little too long. I probably have no right standing up here. I, my brain's not working, but I'm just so happy to be here back with you guys. And Romans 8.29 has been sitting on me for three weeks. So let's turn back to Romans 8. Thanks to Rick Hallahan, who preached on Reformation Sunday. I thought that was one of the best sermons I've heard on the Reformation. Nate Thompson bringing us back to the heart of it all. Uh, Brian Rutland, uh, Jumped in last second to do a wedding, and Mateo Salinas probably had the hardest thing. He had to wait and see if I was going to even be able to preach, so he had to be sitting here. And Mateo, if you're here, you still might get called up. I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> this morning. So before we begin, I just want to do a quick infomercial. Um, we have a, um, some people, a couple different people, but one with a service dog here at the church. And it's real important to the health of the, the woman who has this service dog. It could be a matter of life and death. So if, if you pet it, 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 it takes away and it breaks the training of what that dog has had. So if you can teach your kids and everybody to not uh, pet the service dogs, it, it's really important to their, to their health. Uh, my next announcement is Paul exhorted the Corinthians to orderliness in the gathering together for the glory of God. And so... Uh, we need to work on an area in our worship for the glory of God. I just want to remind you, service begins at 10.30, 10.30, and I would love for you to prepare your hearts and just come ready to worship. And, and what's happening is we got this great love and family reunion going on every Sunday, which I just love that. I, I, it's better than, you know, just everybody coming in looking somber and sour, and everyone's like, you know, just, look, somebody moved, you know, and then, so I like what's going on, but it's erupting out in the foyer, and it's so joyful and loud that only about 10% of the church is here uh, at 10.30, and then the noise from the foyer is coming into where we can't even uh, hear. So poor Thomas is just pouring out his heart with us, and nobody's listening, and, and, so, um, um, and then those who are trying to listen can't hear over the noise. So uh, I just, to love to each other and to worship to our God, to, to come in at 1030 um, and strive to, to be on time. We, we always know there's going to be exceptions and, and come in and Thomas is going to begin with music and then um, at 1030 we're going to get it started. There'll be some ushers helping to remind you at 1030 when it begins. So again, we know there are exceptions. If you see someone and you say, how you doing? And they start crying, don't say it's 1030, I got to leave. You know, so I just want you to know all things to be done in order and love for the glory of God alone. And, and uh, we used to, it used to be at 1030, if you knocked on the door, we'd say, away from you, I never knew you. And I refuse to go back to that. But please work hard to come in here to, and worship at 1030 and not be so loud, because every time that door opens, we can't hear anything. So end of infor infomercial. Are you glad I'm back? To, okay, it's just to help work through big things like that. So let, let's pray and open up the Word of God. Um, what God has set for us this morning is unbelievable in Romans 8. And so let's go to Him and pray that He'll bless us. Father, I thank You for this book. And what we look at this morning, God, is weighty and it's big and it's heavy and it's beautiful. And I, I pray that now, by your spirit, you would just unfold this word to every heart. God, we need you to, to do things, to teach us, to instruct us as we're beginning to look at the, 
eternal counsels of God. And so little puny human minds don't do well with this and it's not easy. And so I pray that by your spirit, through this word that you have given to us, you would lead and guide us and do more than we could hope or believe. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> okay, look with me at Romans 8, 28. Last time we were together in Romans, we took up verse 28. I want to read it again. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who have been called according to his purpose. And for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And the, these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Last time we were together in Romans 8, we looked at this massive promise of God in Romans 8, 28, that he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those who have been called according to his purpose. It's so big and all-encompassing of our entire life, that promise. And our context is some pretty big things like the futility of this world, peril and sword and martyrdom. And as a pastor, there's some weighty things that are hitting this body. <clears throat> to stand on promises like Romans 8.28 are just necessary and life-giving and hope-giving. And it's so big, it just, it needs to be propped up. This promise needs a foundation that I can stand on in every high and stormy gale. So much is going to come against this verse that it's got to be anchored. It's got to be tethered or you're just going to be blown away and tossed when the storms of life come and the difficulties hit you. And Romans 8, 28 just goes to your fingers. Paul's going to give that to us this morning and for the next few weeks. He's going to do it in a way that's going to go beyond our understanding or comprehension. It's a massive foundation for this promise. And that is to bring about an assurance and a confidence of God. In verse 28, accomplishing his purpose. To those who've been called according to his purpose, he's going to start unfolding. What is that purpose? What is this eternal purpose of God that we've been called into as the children of God? And he's going to end in this Christ likeness and glory forever where we're going to dwell with him and there'll be no end. If all hell then is set against this purpose of God, then I need all heaven and all the promises of God to stand up against all of this. All that's going to assail this promise. I need Romans 8, 29 through 30 to be a bulwark never failing. And so what we're going to undertake is awesome, and that is the right way to use this word. It is absolutely awesome what we're about to look at. The answer to uphold this verse is God. In eternity past to eternity future, the purpose of God, his predetermined plan for why he even made this world, it's all of grace. We're going to look at what's called the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. It's all theocentric. It's God-centered. This is probably the broadest definition of the word grace in the entire Bible that we are going to be studying. <clears throat> and I, I have what's called COVID brain, and I, this brother of mine gave me this massive chain with five links. And, and I was going to pull it out and just show you this link that is unbreakable, and it's those whom, whom he foreknew those whom he predestined, those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he glorified. It's this chain that can't be broken. So next week, come back. You get to see this big old chain that I've been excited to show you. So my great textual analyzers, as we begin this section then, what is missing in that list? What jumps out at me is me is missing. The chain of grace is me being brought into the purpose of God being brought into his great salvation. But I'm painfully absent from doing anything in all five of these actions. These are God. 
I'm just the object of his five actions. But all five are me being acted upon by God. And here's the glory and the strength producing hope of Romans 8.28. I do none of the action in the chain of grace. God does it all. It's a beautiful that it's all of God. There used to be a TV show when I was, I can't remember how old it is, but it, some of you might remember it. And then they'd say, you are the weakest link. And, and if you just put me in this little chain, it would break. There, there wouldn't be any hope. And so these five links are God. They're sovereignty. They're his actions and his purposes. I want you to hear that with all my heart. It's not you who holds you in this chain of grace, but grace that holds you from beginning to end. This is a great ride called the grace of God. And when you're brought into it, you're kept in it for all of eternity because of God, not because of how strong you are or smart. This is so beautiful what we're going to look at. So can anything break in? and disrupt this amazing grace of God in our lives. Can anything stop it? Can anything pull us out of it? Can anything bring us back under condemnation? Can anything separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? I say no. Can anything yank me out of Romans 8, 28, that God is working everything for good in my life? Can anything stop that? And the answer this morning is nothing. You've been brought into the inner chamber of God's grace. The favor in which we stand now. Remember back in Romans 5 too, we stand in grace. And I'm afraid we see in a mirror dimly the massive reality of this truth that we're going to start unfolding. In verse 29, <clears throat> the four has been a life changer for me. You don't start sentences with four. The chain of grace that we are brought into. Let it take away this morning your fears and your doubts and your worries that you might let go. But the world and the flesh and the devil are too great that I might not finish this race. My strength and gifts are so small, but his grace is so infinite and big and powerful and everlasting and any other adjectives that you can come up with table that God has set before us in Romans 8, 29 through 30 is unbelievable. So let's dig in and each, uh, we're just going to look at each link and it's going to take us three weeks. I'm sorry. I was going to do it in two and there's just no way. So where's Robert? Well, let's talk about preaching December 5th instead of November. It's up to you, man. I, but I, I hate to break a five chain link, but if we have to, we will. We might have to, but before we do, I want to clarify one thing. We're going to look at amazing and, and big truths about God's grace. We're going to go back in time. We're going to go to eternity future, and we're going to look at all the eternal counsels and the, and the eternal choices made by God. We're going to look at his eternal purposes, and you start getting into the eternal mind and heart of God as finite beings, and it's not easy. And it's not always comfortable. So we're going to need the Word of God. And no one could get what we're going to look at by natural reasoning or by observations or by meditation. I wasn't there in eternity past. <laughs> were you? I could have never known what happened and what was God's purpose without Him revealing it to me. The natural mind will never come up with what we're about to look at. And so what I'm going to ask you in the weeks ahead as we journey this <clears throat> is that I can breathe, is that we let God teach, teach us on these things, like foreknowledge and predestination and calling, and not just your own reasoning, not what we think should happen. And the one thing I just, I can't have is, that's not fair. God is the God of infinite justice. He can only do what is right, okay? Little created ones with puny knowledge don't tell God what is fair, okay? So let's just, let's just let God tell us what's fair as we begin this study. 
God, this is the, the way you got to run your universe. I, I can't let you do that if I love you. You can't do that. We got to come to the word of God and say, God, teach me. Teach me what this word says. Will you let God be God and inform us with this perfect revelation from his word, what these terms and ideas and purposes are? Because we'll get them wrong every time if we're left to ourselves. History has proven it. I've had people say, I want you to hear this, election isn't in the Bible. Depending on what version you look at, the one I looked up, the word believer was used two times in the New Testament to refer to us. The word Christian was used three times. And the word elect, chosen, or set apart for God is used 76 times in the New Testament to describe us. So let's just start with it is in the Bible and then go say, what does it mean? Okay? But that's how, that's how the Bible refers to us. God's chosen, his elect, his called out ones. Because what is our battle? What do you think is our greatest battle before we begin looking at this? We've, we've got presuppositions from living where? In America. <laughs> America brings problems. We're, we're so, we've been raised on rights that that is the most sacred thing of our country, at least it used to be. The focus of our country right now is everything's about rights. And we stand up and we preach that the only right you have is to go to hell for treasuring the world more than the one who made it and suppressing him is insanity. If you go get the church growth manuals, they won't have a chapter on this. But we've been having parking lot issues lately and I thought I would take care of them with a little study on predestination. <laughs> <clears throat> that is a joke. I'm sorry. So why then do you preach on stuff like this? If it just causes division, what's wrong with you? No doctrine I've ever come across stirs up more emotion and strife. <laughs> I taught this one time in a college group, and I had guys throwing their Bibles on the ground yelling at me. So why do that? <laughs> I'm a nice guy. I don't like fighting. <laughs> why are you doing this? Because the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, Paul, thinks it's the foundation of our whole hope of Romans 8.28 and strengthening and equipping us on our journey to glory. It's essential to know the grace of God and not just in a myoptic way. I feel like the American church knows grace as this one little moment where you make a decision and that's all when they think of grace. And, and I'm about to blow your minds away with God wants you to see the eternal just value of grace and how it works and how big it is. It's not just some little small dot. It is so much bigger. And God wants you to know the fullness of grace, not little snapshots. And so hear this. This is not for controversy. It's for comfort. It's not to cause division but unity in praising God for this great grace. This is to be used to strengthen each other under great affliction and suffering as we look at the chain of grace. And this is so big and so beautiful that it must be preached and it must be taught so I can anchor that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who have been called according to his purpose. With that, this is a long introduction. I've been away too long, sorry. <laughs> We're a unified elder board and we love our sheep. And we want to shepherd you deeply into the grace of God. And we believe that understanding the eternal decrees and election and all that we're going to look at, they're, they're not what are going to save you. Looking into election and understanding it perfectly isn't what saves you. We, we believe it's the reason you're saved. But to be saved, God has held out the Lord Jesus Christ as the object of your faith. And anyone who beholds him by faith will be saved eternally. 
For I have resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. We all believe that this Bible teaches what I'm going to share in the weeks ahead. This week we join the Reformed teaching of the church. But it's not what saves you. It's not looking at election, but looking at Jesus Christ that saves. So if you do not believe our interpretation of foreknowledge, predestination, calling, all these things that we will look at, but you have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we receive you as our brother and our sister. We love you and we want to lay down our lives to help shepherd you. You're welcome here and you'll be loved and overseen and you will not be a second class citizen. So we love you and so does God. It just started before the foundation of the world. So I would, I'd like to ask you one thing as we begin. Don't judge God by feeble sense. I want you to look at the words, the context, and our studies, and get your conclusion from the Word of God and not how I feel about it. Or think that this issue is just as simple as throwing out John 3.16 and saying, oh, that ends it. We just can't pick and choose favorite verses, but we need to work hard in the Word of God to understand these concepts because they're an eternal God revealing Himself to temporal humans. And I'm going to quote George Mueller, and I want to pray one more time for why he says we should study these truths. He said, as to the effect which my belief in these doctrines has on me, I'm constrained to state for God's glory that though I am still exceedingly weak and by no means so dead to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life as I might be and as I ought to be yet, By the grace of God, I have walked more closely with him since that period. My life has not been so variable, and I may say that I have lived much more for God than before since coming to understand these doctrines of grace. And so I pray that the reason we're going to labor in these is they're biblical, and they have changed my life. And I'm praying that as you see them and you look into them, they would be transforming to your own lives as well. So let's pray, and then we'll open God's Word. Father, I pray now, as we open up this chain of grace, Lord, it is unbelievable. And I want every mind and heart to be overwhelmed and taken away with it. And this first link that we're going to look at, would you meet us here now and let every mind and heart be overwhelmed with the beauty of what we're about to look at. God bless us. Put yourself on display as a saving God. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mateo, how you feeling, brother? Okay, I'm going to go for it. All right, last time we were together, here's your outline. (laughs) Paul gave us four elements to strengthen us in how God works in our trials. And we looked at the certainty of verse 28, and we know, we know, we, we know from the truth of God's word and what he's revealed. And so this isn't uh, just something that we guess, we, we, we know this. And then we looked at the extent of it. What is it that we know that God causes all things to work together for good? And so everything in our lives, he takes these bad things, difficult, hard things, and he's, he's shaping and he's using them to mold you into the image of Jesus Christ. He's going to use all trials, everything in your life. Nothing comes by surprise. The devil doesn't overcome God. He is at work in your life to conform you to Christ. And he picks the right way every time for every person. Receive it. Embrace the glory and the beauty of God. Who are the recipients of such a promise? Well, those who love God. The whole gospel is he causes you to love him and to those who have been called according to his purpose. And now we're going to unfold what is that purpose that God's called us into. He's called you into life and he's called you into this purpose. And now we're going to look at it. The source, the fourth point is, is grace. And it's this whole chain of grace that we will now begin to look at that will undergird this promise. So look at verse 29, 4. <clears throat> this could be translated because, I love this word for, this is 
how we stand on Romans 8, 28. What's his purpose? And when I'm done showing you his purpose in your life, you're going to be able to rest more confidently and stronger in Romans 8, 28. So that's what I'm praying for each one of you. It's not that you just learn a bunch of doctrine, but as you learn this, you're, you're going to be unflappable and untouchable with whatever comes into your life because you believe Romans 8, 28. That's what I'm after. That's what I'm praying for this flock that I love with all my heart. That's why I'm standing up here this morning. Let's look at the first link of the beautiful chain that I'm going to show you next week. Look at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, <laughs> the order is not haphazard. This is how God puts his purpose into operation. He's called you into his purpose. And how did he begin? And how does he start this purpose that he's called you into, his eternal purpose for creating the world with human beings, with a plan of salvation. Just a brief outline, if you'll look at this chain, in verses one through two, you have a God who foreknows and predestines. And all of this is in the mind of God and the heart of God in eternity past. So we're beginning this chain with going all the way back in time. We're going to eternity past. And then we're moving to time and space where he says, uh, you're justified. We've been studying that for two years, so I'm not going to get lost in it. You're, 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 you believe in Jesus. You're made right with God. You're justified. And those whom he justifies on that last day, he's going to glorify you. and He's going to make you perfect. And he's going to finish the work of making you like Jesus Christ. And there's this one little thing in the middle that connects eternity past with our lives in eternity future. And it's this little word called. And then he's going to take these purposes, what he's set in your life and what he wants to do in your life. And in time and space, when you walk, he's going to call you and he's going to call you to life, and you're going to believe in Jesus and be justified. And so what takes the eternal past and the eternal future is in, in, in some time, every one of you in here, if you're a believer, God called you. And then that's what links these together. This is how you, you know it's taken place. And so we'll, we'll work through each one of those, but I just wanted you to take a peek at the chain before we begin. <coughs> Are you tired because we're going to labor in a whole bunch of word studies, and, and there's a reason. And if you'll work with me this morning, you're going to get one of the greatest blessings you've ever had, okay? If you want to go to sleep, okay, just do it, okay? Just do it, and then I'll, I'll give you, I'll meet you later and tell you what you missed. <laughs> Let's take a look then. For new, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this is the most important term in the chain, the rest hangs on this one word, foreknew. This was God's first move in our direction, foreknowledge. And I think this has lost its beauty in Christendom. <clears throat> I hear a lot of talk about predestination and a lot of talk about election, but just so little people talk about foreknowledge, foreknew. And this truth is, is just so... Beautiful. Understanding this term will change your life. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. This could heal a thousand hurts that you've walked in here with this morning if you could understand this. This is a, this is a reason. This is the foundation stone in grace. And I want to dig into it now this morning. There's much debate. Uh, again, not debate if there's predestination, but how is it defined? And it's been boiled down to two main views, and I want to go over those views as we begin this morning. The first we call the Reformed view. Luther held that, Edwards, Calvin, Spurgeon, a lot of the current, MacArthur, Sproul, Begg, Keller, Piper. So there's, there's a whole bunch of people who would hold to this Reformed view. And this other view is called the Prescient view. And the Prescient view, the reason I'm going to explain it is it's very, very popular today. And the key verse for their argument is Romans 8, 29. <clears throat> and the argument is for all of eternity that God has prior knowledge of actions and human beings. 
And we're all in agreed with that, agreement on that. That's called the omniscience of God. He knows everything. He knows everything from an eternal perspective. But this view, what it says is he knows who will and who will not respond to the gospel. He, he looks down the future and, and he can see who will respond to the gospel. Uh, this one will, this one won't. And on the basis of his prior knowledge to our response to the gospel, he predestines those who will say yes to his offer of salvation. So all that God foreknows is their faith. And he foreknows their faith. And because they have faith, he predestines them. And that's called the corridor of time view. And I just want to share with you why I have a few problems with that view. First, have you ever heard the word eisegesis? Instead of exegesis is to draw out from the text what it means, eisegesis is you read into it what you want. And I believe this is a classic case of eisegesis. <clears throat> Sorry about the coughing, guys. It's worth, just labor with me, forget the cough, okay? It's so sweet. Charles Spurgeon said, where are those words which you have added, whom he did foreknow to repent, whom he foreknew to believe, and to persevere in grace? I don't find them in the English version or the Greek original. If I could so read them, the passage would certainly be very easy and would very greatly alter my doctrinal views. But as I do not find those words there, begging your pardon, I do not believe in them. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that election is based on your faith. And next week I'm going to prove that. I'm just going to read you one verse, just the opposite. In Acts 13, 48... It says, when the Gentiles heard this gospel, <laughs> they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So as many that were appointed to eternal life believed that message. Second, what would God see if he looked down the corridor of time? I mean, what, what have we spent two years doing in Romans? Romans. Romans 1 through 3, we spent the whole time showing you that man is dead in his trespasses and sins. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, you're under the wrath of God. Romans 3 says there's none who seek for God, not even one. And so when God looks down the corridors of time, here's what he said in Genesis 6, 5. The Lord looked down and he saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So if God looks down the corridors of time and does nothing to your heart, you will never believe. All you'll do is resist him for all of eternity. That's what we have learned through the whole book of Romans. Unless God comes and invades your life, you're going to go off the cliff. You're just, there's not good raw material since Adam's sin. We come into the world now, spiritual stillborns. That's what God would see if he looks down the corridors of time. Thirdly, prescience is not an explanation of predestination, but a denial of it. Destiny is caused by what people do, not what God does. There's no predetermining in that whatsoever. It is God saying, I predestined that what happened is going to happen. I could do that. I predetermine that because you have faith, you will have faith. So it doesn't, it doesn't help. It doesn't explain predestination at all. It takes it away. Fourthly, prescience reverses the whole order. All who respond to the gospel in faith are predestined. He foreknows you. He predestines you. He calls you, and then you believe, and you're justified, and then you're glorified. The text says that he predestines you. That's why he calls you. And when he calls you, you respond in faith. And everyone who is called has faith. Next week, we'll see the effectual call is live, and the cry of the newborn baby is faith. And then this is my, my most important issue that I have this morning. What is it that causes you to differ? And a lot of us don't like to think about this. But if it's God looking down the corridors of time and seeing that you are smart enough to believe, and, and so what caused you to differ from anyone else on this earth 
is you. And the view I'm about to show you, what causes you to differ is God. And I'll show you right now that that's what everything in this book is about, is the glory of God, not the glory of man. So what I want to move to then is the second view, and this is the view that we would hold to here at this church, is the Reformed view for foreknow. Webster says it's to, to, to know before. Prognosco, it was where we get the word prognosis. It's a medical term, and it's to tell you beforehand what's going to happen. But to get to the, to the meaning of this word, it's a little bigger than Webster, so we're going to go to the, to, the, to the Greek. Seven New Testament occurrences of this word foreknowledge. So if you want to find out what does foreknow mean, you go study the word. And there are seven uses of the word foreknowledge. That makes it easy that there's not like 38 or something. First two, it's knowing beforehand uh, where, where both deal with, with man. <laughs> but So the five occurrences that I want to look at is where it's in reference to God. And that's what we're studying here. So if you'll flip over to Romans chapter 11, we're, I'm going to try to move through this quickly. It's used in verse 2, Romans 11, 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So he, he, he didn't reject his people whom he foreknew. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, and he says through Cappadocia, Asia, those who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Then it's used in 1 Peter 1.20, for he was foreknown, Jesus, before the foundation of the world. Acts 2, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, that he, he knew the Son of God, sovereign determination. And so what I want you to hear is all five usages breathe divine determination. None of those have anything to do with response. All of them, catch this, God foreknows persons, not actions or events. So foreknowing is always people, not actions. So that's the big blow to the quarter of time looking down. It's not actions. God foreknows people. And it's, it's whom, it's an accusative, which is the object. And so whom God foreknows, persons. He foreknows people. He predestines people. He calls people. He justifies people. He glorifies people. It's not actions. And what's more is this word for foreknew has really deep roots in the Old Testament for the word to know. The word know means cognition, but it also can refer to an intimate relationship. And it can also deal with selection and choice. I want you to listen to Genesis 4.1. <laughs> Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Adam had an intimate relationship with his wife, and they used the word knew. That's our word. It's used in Luke 1.34. Mary said to the angel, how shall this be uh, since I have gnosko, no husband? I have known no husband. How can I give birth to a baby? And so it's this intimate knowledge, relationship. And the usage of this word started spilling over to spiritual intimacy as well. In Psalm 1.6, it says, The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. He knows them in this intimate way. Hosea 13.5, It was I who knew you in the wilderness and the land of drought. And then that famous verse in Matthew 7.21 Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many are going to say to me on the last day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. I never had an intimate relationship with you. Jesus knows everyone. It's this intimacy of knowledge. John 10, 14, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. 
Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay my life down for the sheep. And this word also became a synonym to elect or choose. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, Jeremiah, I knew you. I selected you. I chose you. I set you apart for my purpose. Amos 3.2, Israel, you only have I known among all the families of the earth. So is, did God not know any of the other nations? Israel, I set my love on you, my affection. I, I chose you. I drew you in to relationship. And now you take this word pro, which is on the front of no, and you get Ephesians 1.4. Just as God chose us in him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him. 2 Timothy 1.9, he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So what, is, what am I getting at? What, what, what is all this word study telling us this morning? Very simple. If you are a Christian, before the foundation of the world, before you were even born, God chose and set his love upon you. He chose you. He put his favor upon you. Of all the people who would ever live, he knew you. That's got to take breath away. That's why Jeremiah said, the Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. I've loved you everlastingly. Therefore, I've acted to bring you into this chain of grace. Because in his sovereign grace, he set his love and favor upon you. He predestined that you would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ that's what causes you to differ. A God who set his love on you before he even spoke a world into being. That's what causes you to differ, not how smart you are. Praise be to God. It's not you that makes you differ. You're not smarter than Billy Bob down the road. Wiser, more intelligent, more pliable that drew God's love to you. Free sovereign grace set his love on you before the foundation of the world. Why did God set his love upon Israel? Because they were such an awesome nation. You've read your Bible. <laughs> Deuteronomy 7, 6, for you're a holy people to the Lord your God. You've been chosen. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than the other peoples, but you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath with which he swore to his forefathers. Why did God set his love upon you? There are so many people who are better than me, kinder, more morals, smarter, better speakers, Paul said, there weren't many among you, wise, mighty, or noble. There's nothing in us to turn God's heart toward us, just away from us. The only explanation is his good pleasure. The kind intention of his will. So if we've been called and justified and persevering in grace this morning... It's because in eternity past, God set his love on you to pour out his blessings upon me for all of eternity. And he did it when I was a hater. I had no faith, only unbelief. The opposite of how we choose whom we will love. And this is the love that we've been looking for all of our lives, aren't we? One writer said, you're looking for love in all the wrong places and all the wrong faces. We were made for this kind of love, but we can't find it anywhere. 
everybody in this world is looking for, but this is what they're looking for. I always quote this from a preacher I heard a long time ago. One of my favorite songs in high school, I used to sing it to my wife. She's not here. She loves when I sing to her. <laughs> uh, it's by a guy named Dan Fogelberg. And it, 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 was, it says longer than. He's, he's trying to describe this love that he has. And he says, before the stars were in the heavens and the fishes were in the oceans, I fell in love with you. And so there's this love that we're all looking for that started before the creation of the world. And we're trying to find it in humans, we're trying to find it in this earth. And what you've been looking for your whole life is this God who before he even created the world, he set his love upon you. To pour out all the blessings that we're going to study in the weeks ahead. He set his love on you. And the beauty, because there was nothing in you that caused it, there's nothing in you that can make it go away. The matchless grace of God with the great love with which he loved us. I want you to ask yourself, will he work all things together for good to those whom he loves? Or is he going to work for your good if he loves you that way. That is why Paul closes the chapter with these words. Can anything separate us from the love of God that's been placed upon us while we were enemies and while we were yet sinners and we merited nothing? It is all based on Christ's eternal counsel and his love. Paul finishes this in chapter 11. He says, Who is first given to God that it might be paid back to him again? For from him foreknowledge, and through him Christ, and to him a glory for all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You can't overemphasize what God has done for us. This morning we're going to go to the table, and I want you to think about what it cost God that he might bring those whom he set his love upon to glory. And I want you to adore his mercy this morning. When, he's, when he sets his love on you, man, he loves you. And he sends his own son into a world and he pierces them through for your transgressions. And the application in Romans 8, 4 that now the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. When this kind of a love overtakes you, and you finally get it, what comes out is love. You finally can keep the requirement of the law. And if you're mean, gnarly, and nasty, you haven't, you haven't tasted this foreknowledge. You might know it academically, but when you get this, you can finally keep the requirement of the law to love other people in a way that no one can. Because I can't get over before the fishes were in the ocean and the stars were in the heavens, he fell in love with me. He set his love on me. And now everything we're about to study, I get because God loves me. And I know that he's going to work everything in my life for good because he loves me. Nothing can get me out from under it. Nothing. You should be woo-hooing. <laughs> Not boo-hooing. Woo-hooing. So is it our love that evokes God's or God's love that evokes ours? And I believe without a doubt it's God's love that evokes ours for the rest of eternity. I'm going to close out I'm going to throw away my notes because I've gone too long. But I've, I've pastored a long time. I'm old. 30 years, I think. 30 years. And you know what? I think I've figured out the number one reason why people reject this doctrine. Is, is last time we were together in Romans 8, I told you, control freaks, you come to Romans 8, 28, and God wants you to stop. He wants you to release everything to him. 
and let him work in your life. And then we come to salvation and you just, you want control. And you want your little free will to be, it makes you feel like you're in control. It feels good. To actually come and say, there's nothing I can do to cause God to love me is humbling. And put you at the feet of Jesus as a man poor in spirit, saying, be merciful to me, the sinner. Instead of, oh, I'm smart. I prayed a prayer. I walked that aisle. I did this. I did that. I just got to sit as a pauper before God and say, have mercy on me, the sinner. And I'll tell you right now, I don't look in the, the, the annals of heaven to see if my name's written in the eternal book of life. As a pauper, I look at Jesus Christ as the only remedy for my sin. And I know that my name has been written before the foundation of the world in that book. And I know that he set his love upon me before the foundation of the world because he brought me to see Jesus as altogether lovely and worth losing my life for. Yeah. Oh, that's why I'm here with COVID this morning. That should change your life. That's the love you've been looking for your whole life. And you keep trying to find it in humans and being disappointed and hurt. And what you're looking for is a God who loved you before the fishes were in the ocean. Isn't that beautiful? Drink that up. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you. If you love us, who could be against us? Who could condemn us? Who could separate us from your love? Oh God, we're ready to stand with Paul and start fighting. Fighting the lies of the devil. All the things that he throws at us. If you love us, you will work everything for our good. You will bring us to glory. Nothing can stop it. God, your love will not let anything stop this purpose that you've called us into. And so, God, I love that grace is so big and eternal counsels and wonderful and amazing. And I pray, let it heal a million hurts here this morning. Let them be overwhelmed. What they couldn't find on this earth, they can find in their God by looking at the gift that he so loved this world that he gave us his son. Oh, God, we thank you for the greatest gift. And we are excited to begin moving into the Christmas season to just look at the greatest gift ever given. And so God, thank you for Christ. And it's in that beautiful, precious name that we do pray. Amen.